Well, good morning, colleagues and friends. Um, as Philip has already indicated today, this morning, that uh, what my role in the project was and is, um, and my role has been centred on the investigation of the agricultural economy, which was undertaken by the native farmers in the Dutch Lima zone in the Roman period. And as such, today I present a computer simulation approach to analysing the paleoeconomy of the study region. So, uh, research has to begin with a motivation and it has to begin with research questions and aims. Um, and the agricultural economy of the region has certainly not been left untouched by uh, archaeologists, archaeobotanists uh, and zoo archaeologists as was, um, because of the extensive archaeobotanical and zoo archaeological records uh, that we have in the region. And this has granted us a detailed, albeit somewhat general, understanding of farming in the Lima zone. Furthermore, we have some excellent studies, such as Borderland Farming by Laura Koistra, and a more recent article uh, by Van Dinter et al. on um, using a landscape capacity um, approach um, to analyse the economy. And this has significantly extended our knowledge of the economy, and in particular has successfully argued that surplus production was possible to some degree uh, by local farmers in the region, which is a departure from the previous pessimistic ideas that this was not possible. However, moving on from the idea, from moving on beyond the conclusion of that, that local settlements could produce a surplus, my research focuses on how and with what impact surplus production um, may uh, have uh, caused for both uh, settlements and the landscape. Specifically, um, research aims is to explore the effects of agricultural strategies on land and labour, land and labour being the, the traditional factors of um, production in classical economics, um, modelling different scenarios of agricultural production to help explain possibly the archaeological record. Important also is to analyse the interplay of different economic activities within an agricultural economy. The agricultural economy of the Lima zone is a mixed economy. They're engaging in arable farming and animal husbandry, and they have to collect wood and fuel. Um, and also important is to understand the interplay of natural and socio-cultural factors in the development of the cultural landscape, in particular in the development of uh, the agricultural economy. Now, why have we chosen computer simulation and why have we chosen agent-based modelling in particular? Well, we want to analyse how cumulative micro-scale processes from a settlement scale can lead to macro-scale outputs over a wider micro-regional or perhaps even a macro-regional scale. Uh, agricultural decisions have causes and effects, and via computer simulation and agent-based modelling, we can observe these effects. Uh, we can also take advantage of computer simulation as the virtual laboratory. So we can si rapidly simulate uh, long periods of time or multiple parameter values. And now agricultural, the agricult agriculture and the agricultural economy are characterised by being unpredictable. Not only do, um, human, does human agency affect agriculture, but the natural environment, the climate, um, causes yearly unpredictability and randomness um, that uh, agent-based modelling and computer simulation can attempt to incorporate. And we've, uh, both, and we've wanted also to both generate hypotheses and test hypotheses uh, regarding the development of agricultural, agriculture in the region. So by to do so, as Philip mentioned, um, we've used NetLogo to produce a simulation model. Um, now, there are certainly critics of using NetLogo in uh, uh, agent-based modelling, and their criticism I can quite understand, having spent four years trying to make a complex agricultural model using this programme. Uh, if I could go back, maybe I would have spent some time to learn Python, but uh, alas... Uh, no, <laughs> I didn't make that decision. So this is what I've got, it is what it is, um, and it's a good first step in the attempt of simulating an entire agricultural economy. Um, so 
the blue boxes here are the variety of parameters that can be uh, changed by the user that will affect the agricultural decision making of the agent. In this case, our agent is an entire settlement. And the settlements have different sizes um, depending on the number of households from one to five, uh, with a household being a married couple with any dependents, uh, elderly or young. Uh, We've also utilized um, the uh, GIS extension that NetLogo has um, in order to um, import Mark's paleogeographic um, reconstructions to uh, test um, our hypotheses within a more realistic landscape. Our initial experiments were done using a randomly generated landscape, which unfortunately doesn't allow us to look at land as a limiting factor. By using the GIS extension, we can look at land as a limiting factor. Um, the green, for example, is the area of flood basin where animals can graze, and the brown, the lighter brown, is the, air, is the arable land. So, for example, in this region, perhaps arable land is more, of a limit, is more limited than the area of flood basin for animal grazing. This is an overview or a flowchart of the main sub-models and processes used in um, my model, um, beginning with the initialization, which sets up the landscape, creates the agents. Uh, the first sub-model is um, a model of population dynamics within the settlement, so household population dynamics. The settlements then uh, undertake arable farming. Uh, they then um, undertake animal husbandry, and they also uh, collect fuel from the landscape. Now, depending on the step number, one step equaling one year, um, they will, the settlements will also be required to rebuild their houses. Houses in the region are built from wood. It is a very wet landscape. The wood doesn't last much more than 20 years or so. Looking now in more detail of each submodel, so beginning with population dynamics, at the beginning, each individual, individual human living in the settlement is given a mortality rate, and this is based on uh, life tables. And Philip later um, will um, present uh, on the demography of the Batavian um, area, um, and the population dynamics will be explained in more detail. I've largely used his um, ideas for this, but in a much more simplified way. Um, women who are married and above six, uh, or 16 or over and less than 50 years old are also assigned a fertility um, rate depending on their age. Uh, and then these married women will reproduce. A random number is generated. If that number is less than the fertility rate, a baby is produced. Otherwise, that year, no, the woman doesn't uh, have, uh, give birth. Then all individuals uh, have the chance to die, depending on the mortality rate. So elder, um, older people are more likely to die because of the higher mortality rate. Younger people and juveniles and adults have a greater chance of staying alive. If um, a man or a woman um, loses their spouse during the death uh, sub, uh, process, they will attempt to find a new spouse. And the... Um, that's done in a, that's a patrilocal marriage. So an adult male will try to find an adult female to marry. They, he will move her into the settlement unless the settlement is full, as in the number of households has been exceeded. Then the married, new married couple will try and form a new settlement unless the settlement density of the region is uh, going to be exceeded, at which point they're removed from the simulation to um, simulate or emulate um, emigration due to... Um, overpopulation and then the variables various different variables and outputs are updated to form the new conditions for the following year uh, moving now to the arable farming sub model to begin with a settlement calculates the required area of arable land for its own consumption uh, the consumption isn't just the amount of grain they need to eat it's also the amount of sowing seed they need for the following year and in some cases um, the requirement of a buffer to protect against catastrophic loss or um, adverse climactic conditions. However, the required area of land 
that a settlement needs is not necessarily the area of land that they can uh, cultivate because the area of land that they can cultivate is also limited by the amount of sowing seed they have, whether the, there is available land and whether there's available labor. So if any of these limit, then it's the um, minimum amount of land, um, uh, sorry, the maximum amount of land that they can cultivate, or if these factors are not limiting, then the settlement will simply cultivate the amount of land it needs to. Because we're also interested in surplus production, we've incorporated a number of different strategies. So the arable strategy of none corresponds to subsistence farming, i.e. the settlements will only cultivate the land they need for consumption. Under a strategy of intensification, the settlements won't cultivate more land, but they'll use that land intensively. They will put manure on the land in order to um, increase uh, yield. Under a strategy of extensification, settlements will use any surplus as sowing seed for the following year in order to cultivate even greater areas of land, provided that there is sufficient labor, accessibility to, uh, and accessibility to land. The yield is calculated, and the yield is um, so simply the amount of uh, land cultivated uh, multiplied by the, the basic average yield, uh, which is 1,000 kilograms per hectare. However, because of annual fluctuations in grain yield, uh, this is uh, further reduced or increased by a factor of 20%. So grain yield per year can fluctuate between 800 kilograms per hectare, which would be a bad year, and 1,200 kilograms per hectare, which would be a good year. Settlements will then decide whether they have sufficient yield to uh, feed their families and to sow uh, land for the next year. And if they do, then the process is stopped. If not, they have the ability to borrow grain from other settlements, provided that other settlements also have surplus grain. Um, the next process is uh, herd dynamics, um, which represents the animal husbandry. So similar to the human uh, population model, uh, a settlement is granted a herd of sheep, cattle, horse, or a combination. These animals reproduce according to the birth rate that each adult animal uh, is given dependent on species. Then there's a natural mortal mortality in which animals die because of disease. And then agents will slaughter their animals depending on the slaughter rates um, which are determined by the strategy of exploitation. For example, uh, settlements exploiting their cattle for milk will try and kill almost all the male animals, a fair amount of young, uh, female young animals, to ensure that they get the maximum uh, milk output. And then the variables again are updated. And the last major sub uh, model is wood acquisition. Settlements will first calculate the amount of wood they need, which is dependent on the um, population size of the settlement the daily per capita consumption, and also how often the settlement will collect wood. If it's collecting every day, then it only needs the, uh, the amount of wood for the population for one day. Every two days, it needs to collect a surplus to cover that day that they're not collecting wood. Now, the uh, then they calculate the workforce, how many people they can actually send into the landscape to collect wood. This may be enough to collect an, um, a large enough workforce to collect enough wood, or it may actually be not enough people, and then they will be consistently collecting too little wood. Uh, the, uh, then they um, locate a cell, um, an area containing wood. And this is based on a central place optimal foraging model in which um, the cell, the area that they choose is an area containing more than the average amount of wood in the whole landscape, and they will continue collecting wood from there and bringing it back to the settlement until that area, the wood available in that area falls below the average, at which point they'll find the next nearest area with more than the average amount of wood in the whole landscape. If they've collected enough wood, great, this process stops. If not, the, the um, process repeats until either there is no more land, the year is over, or they've collected enough wood. So moving now on to the major findings, we began with experimenting in a randomly generated landscape 
to try and understand the optimum farming strategies for uh, settlements under a subsistence farm, uh, for, uh, subsistence economy. So under a subsistence economy, figure seven shows the mean area of land required for grain production. And it corresponds to just in excess of one hectare per household. Um, However, the area of land um, is, um, that they need access to is probably higher because it's largely assumed that in the late uh, Iron Age pre-Roman period, uh, biennial fallow was taking place. So each year, they may only cultivate one hectare. However, they will need two hectares in total within their catchment area to um, produce sufficient food. So figure eight shows the mean number of hours expended per agricultural task. We've reduced these down to three major tasks, plowing, sowing, and harvesting. Now, owing to the assumptions used in this model, 90% of labor expended in agriculture is for plowing and harvesting. Uh, unsurprisingly, the more households a settlement possesses, the more inhabitants, and so the greater the area of land needed to produce sufficient grain. And this therefore means it results in more labor being spent. Zooarchaeological evidence from the region points to a general trend of exploiting cattle and sheep for meat and milk in the late Iron pre-Roman age. However, variation between settlements does indeed exist, and so different exploitation strategies were simulated. In figure nine shows the mean yields of meat, milk, and manure, which we've assumed to be the uh, major um, outputs of a cattle herd, um, exploited for different things. So red is a herd exploited for meat, blue is a herd exploited for milk, and green is a herd exploited for the products it supplies whilst a, cat, a cow is alive, traction and manure. Now we can see that meat yields are very low if we compare to the amount of milk being produced and the amount of manure being produced. Uh, the small sizes of herds that arise from the combination of natural mortality rates and slaughter rates in cattle, yields, uh, in cattle herds prevent large meat yields. And in fact, the calories that can be derived from the meat of, uh, of a cattle herd are low enough that settlements with more than two households must either reduce consumption of meat and therefore increase um, reliance on grain or keep multiple herds. In the former situation, um, more uh, arable land is required. In the latter, more pasture land is required. In some regions, um, there may be difficulties in doing this, therefore. The yields of meat and milk from sheep are minimal compared to those available from cattle, shown here. Uh, these, this is the yields of meat from sheep. They can either be exploited for meat, for milk, or for wool. Uh, and this may indicate, perhaps, that sheep were not an important element of the diet, but rather had a, uh, produced a specialized product, particularly wool, for example. In both cases, we've seen that the milk yields from herds are very high, and these can produce quite a few, um, uh, uh, quite a lot of calories. And this have made, may have been a, an important product. And here we can see the average area of land for cattle. This is much higher than for sheep, shown here. Uh, I will just skip over this because I've completely overestimated time. This, in sub, uh, this is an example of a potential labor bottleneck in subsistence farming. Here in July, settlements must also collect fuel, but they also must collect and um, produce fodder for their animals. For a single settlement containing only two adults, a uh, single household settlement, sorry, containing only two adults, should one of those adults die, then they have a serious problem in July that they don't have enough labor to fulfill the tasks within the allotted time. The archaeological, the implications for this um, will need to be discussed 
So what happens when they change um, surplus, um, from subsistence production to surplus production? Under a subsistence strategy, surplus grain is, can be produced because of the buffer, but it cannot be guaranteed. However, on a, under an extensifying process, uh, surplus grain can be guaranteed, and the amount of surplus is significantly higher. However, this comes at a cost. Um, they need uh, substantially more uh, larger areas of land, and the land cultivated here corresponds to the upper limit that they, their settlement um, can uh, cultivate according to the amount of labor they have. And if they undertake a strategy of uh, intensification, they must undertake a new task, that's manuring, um, which also will um, increase the total labor expenditure, therefore. There is also, from the zooarchaeological evidence, um, potential for um, uh, horse breeding being undertaken in the area. Now, horses require a large amount of land also, and this corresponds to roughly the same amount of land that a herd of cattle exploited for milk would require. But by uh, breeding cat horse, uh, they can, a settlement can get a, a surplus of around seven horses per year, seven immature horses per year that can be used as, as a surplus commodity, which um, means that not every settlement in the region would have needed to breed horses to produce, uh, provide enough horses for the Roman army. Only some would have had to need to specialize in this. And there's also potential for surplus meat production, provided that settlements keep multiple herds, two to three herds, and we start getting a small surplus. For a smaller, for one uh, household, this may um, reach the upper limit of how many herds can be kept um, according to the restrictions of labor. But for a larger household, then this falls well below the total amount, that, um, the, to the maximum number they can keep. And once again, under extensification, in September, we see a further bottleneck. Again, if a single household loses one member of its workforce, uh, then they have troubles in September fulfilling uh, their agricultural tasks. So in summary, settlements are required to produce a buffer to ensure enough food every year. Labor expenditure is manageable under subsistence farmer, farming under normal demographic profiles. However, as I said, if uh, members of the uh, workforce are lost, then problems are encountered. Animal herds under different exploitation strategies require different areas of land and different labor expenditure. Sheep herds exploited for different products largely do not. For larger settlements, multiple herds are required to produce sufficient animal-derived calories. Otherwise, an increase in the proportion of diet comprising grain must be uh, increased. And optimum collection of fuel is once per day. Moving to the summary of surplus production, subsistence arable farming does not preclude sur surplus grain production, but neither does it guarantee it. Intensification and extensification produce larger surpluses of grain, but intensification relies on the availability of manure, and extensification is limited by available labor. And we can see a further possible labor bottlenecks occurring under extensification for small households. Settlements can, as far as labor is a limiting factor, keep multiple herds, and only some settlements would have needed to specialize in horse breeding to supply sufficient animals for the army. Now there's a, some, a small bit of further work uh, I've spoken a lot about labor being a limiting factor, but land is also a limiting factor within agriculture. In a randomly generated landscape, we cannot use land as a limiting factor. However, by incorporating uh, paleogeographic re reconstruction, we can. So I have the data for applying what we know from the experiments with subsistence and surplus production for each of these subregions, including uh, in which we've also um, use the settlement density known from the archaeological record. Um, however, yet to uh, analyze them in a way that can be presented. So that is the next step um, to look at how land is a limiting factor in our region. So thank you for your attention. <coughs>